Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So, uh, it is evening, I have done my assignments today, well, I've done one assignment, um, I am doing them over reading week, uh, it's reading week this week, and I think what I'm going to do is do videos in the evening, or video in the evening, and then use that as reinforcement to do the assignments, because I think, oh, I've got a video I can do tonight, because sometimes I like the assignment, sometimes the topics are quite interesting and I think, oh, actually, I'm quite enjoying this. But then other times you get an assignment and you think, mm, is, do I really have to go for all these scientific journals about this specific topic? You think, oh, it's not really that great. Um, and then you get other assignments that are in the middle. Uh, so yeah, what was I going to say? Did I already say, so yeah, I forget these things, I forget so bad. Did I already say what topic we're doing today? If I didn't, we, uh, what we are doing, we're doing individuation today, which is a very interesting one. Um, so I want to sort of uh, talk about individuation in a certain way. I'm not going to colorize the entire concept. I'm not going to talk about the entire concept, but I'm going to talk about like certain aspects of it. So if you want maybe a little bit more of a well-rounded uh, look at individuation, you'll have to try and dig it out of that four and a half hour Jung video that I did, uh, an introduction to Jungian psychology. It'll be in there somewhere. Uh, I want to say it was about two to three hours in, something like that. So, um, but I'm not going to talk about individuation in a, in a crazy detail. I might talk about it in like the actual process, I don't know, I was going to say I might talk about the process in some rounded terms, but I don't think I will, because to talk about the process, we have to really get into the unconscious side of it, the natural side of it, we have to get into the conscious side of it as well, and interpreting dreams, and not only interpreting dreams, but from the unconscious side of it, realizing how our dreams are working within us, within our conscious behavior to orient us in a certain direction that leads us down a certain path, which then potentially becomes our own individuation. I don't think I'm going to go into that with the necessary detail because really to actually assess individuation as a concept or to really talk about it as a concept, we have to go very, very deep we have to go very, very intricate and we have to think, right, so we've got this person and they have these particular archetypal associations and those archetypes are over these numerous, 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 numerous life events playing within the individual in a certain way to move them towards a certain, let's say, line of experience that then goes to uh, create, let's say, an individualized expression within a personality uh, of certain uh, instinctual representations in archetypal form, in, in the way they're presented on the world stage. And it's very, very hard to do because we have all of these complexes that we would have to assess. We have we have some sort of an antiodromian um shift that's happened as well or that could happen so that then that's then coming into consciousness and reinforcing another particular behavior and then that's a part of their individuation and so you have to include that in it as well and then you start get you know you think to yourself it's just too much to explain in one video and it's too much to elaborate on in in the full of what it what it actually is it's so complex and that's and, and that's a testament to its name as well individuation the fact that it is there is of course a collective element to individuation but there's also an individual element to it and so uh yeah it is a testament to its name of, of how complex and how um individual it is um so i won't go into that side of it too much but what i will do is color a, a certain understanding of it. Um, so Anelia Jaffrey, 
young secretary called it um, a dying into life. Individuation is a dying into life. And it's a very good, um, simple description of individuation. So, we have the certain Jungian concepts, the shadow, the persona, the anima, the animus, all that sort of stuff. And basically a whole individualized expression of those plus the other archetypes as well. And certain archetypes will be more prevalent in certain individuals. A whole integrated personality with those in then is individuation. The male aspect of the person, the feminine aspect of the person, the shadow, the evil element. Well, not solely evil element because in certain people the shadow can be positive if as Marie Louise von Franz pointed out the individual has actually lived the shadow in their conscious life so for example she drew the analogy with criminals criminals have lived the shadow the evil side of, of their personality in their consciousness so as a compensatory mechanism in their unconscious their shadow is good, is righteous, is noble. Um, and so uh, the shadow necessarily isn't just the evil side of the personality. Um, you could kind of colour it as alter ego um, because then that doesn't necessarily, although it does have a small connotation to it, but it doesn't necessarily define completely that that is evil. It's just a... a a personality that is alternative to your conscious personality. Um, and so you could say, well, the criminal has an alter ego of someone who's all nice and lovely and agreeable and because the criminal is often disagreeable. So then uh, the, the, the alter ego, oh, well, that's going to be agreeable and we're going to be all lovey-dovey and possibly possibly the criminal, if we're a man, he's very, very masculine as well. Um, so the, the, the shadow might be subtly less masculine, of course, because the shadow uh, draws upon the gender of the, the individual. But because, let's say, that individual has presented such fierce, dominant masculinity, let's say, um, within the confines of, of criminality and stuff like that, the shadow might be just subtly, that might play with their masculine side in a subtly different way and, and animate it in a different way. So pulling that out of the unconscious, realizing it, integrating it through dreams or the rest of it over a very, very long time period, um, then also that, that integration means that you're a whole personality as well. Um, and of course, the persona, the, the obvious one of the cultural role, the thing that you present to the world as well in terms of a, uh, idealism of who you want others to perceive you as and things like that. Um, but also within the cultural role as um, you behave in a particular way within a particular op occupation and therefore you have a certain ex societal expectation of that particular role within that particular occupation. And so all these things come in over, over the years and form a whole personality. Um, now, individuation, as I've touched upon before, does not mean spiritual awakening. It doesn't, that's not what it means. Within the confines of individuation, in terms of the distinction of natural individuation, which is unconscious individuation or conscious individuation or just individuation, um, when you get conscious individuation, that's inclusive of spiritual awakening, but it doesn't mean spiritual awakening. As soon as you get spiritually awakened, that doesn't mean you're individuated. By no means at all does that mean you're individuated. Individuation in this idea of a dying into life means over a number of years, ridding yourself, either consciously or unconsciously, it doesn't matter, but ridding yourself of all of the prejudices against experience that you 
have. So what that means is, let's say that you uh, have a bad relationship with um, food in the sense that you don't like to eat uh, certain foods and things like that, then that in a way works within you as a mild complex as well, especially if it's something that really does start to orient your behavior, then it can start to actually get into quite a high grade complex. Um, and I mean, that's seen obviously in people with anorexia and stuff like that. But of course, there's even more complexities with that neuropsychologically with certain areas of the brain um, actually responding differently as well to certain stimuli or stimulus. Um, so, of course, that's quite complicated. But let's say that you have a certain, uh, you know, a mild aversion or whatever to those things, and you do have a bit of just a mild complex built up around that, then you have to jump into that and you have to eat those foods that you don't like and die you, you literally your ego dies it's a dying into life because it's not well oh i'm just gonna protect myself here and just put all these walls around me it's right okay the dreams are telling me these things i know that my individuation is pushing me towards look i need to get rid of this to be able to realize a better more whole version of myself and so you do those things and maybe you've got a, an aversion to some other thing, whatever it may be, it, do, it really doesn't matter. Or maybe you've got certain complexes bound up within you uh, from childhood or whatever it may be. And so those things all have to be, be pulled out. And the process of psychoanalysis really, in terms of the depth psychology, is pulling out. Imagine you've got a gutter and you've got all leaves on that gutter. And all those gunk and those leaves in that gutter that are, that are meaning that the water can't flow down the drain um, are complexes or, or certain experiences and stuff that you haven't worked through. So the process of depth psychology is pulling all that crap out. And then what happens over a period of time is that once some of that's pulled out, you, you're experiences of the things that you previously thought were horrendous and that you couldn't do, suddenly you think, oh, well, actually, I could probably do that. And then ultimately you get over the complex. It takes, it can take quite a long time for a complex to dissolve down, dissolve down, dissolve down, come into your consciousness enough to do that and then fully just be got rid of. Um... So that's what it is. It's this dying into life and this process of one, getting rid of one thing, getting rid of the other, getting rid of the other, getting rid of the other. Now, people who've had a healthy development, it's not too bad because you think, well, if you've had a healthy development, you've not got yourself bound up with too many complexes in childhood. So uh, when you get to like 25, 30, whatever, whatever age it is, um, Generally, you know, you, you're open to quite a lot of experiences anyway. You've not got really any things, m many things, let's say, not any, but many things tying you back. You might have little complexes here and there, very tiny things, but nothing too bad. So in that case, of course, it's... Uh, obviously, they may already have quite a good relationship with the shadow... There might be certain things within their shadow that we don't accept. It might be that they've, over a number of years, especially when we get into sort of 35 or so, they've started to be more aware of that, whether it's sort of unconsciously, semi-consciously or, or fully consciously. And then they've accepted those bad sides of a personality in, in consciousness a little bit more. Um, whether that's, as I say, just naturally um or or otherwise um but you know they can then get to let's say a, a more natural individuation and uh it's not too hard you know it's not crazy hard or anything but there's always still things that you need to die to there's always still things that need to sort of be burned off within you and indeed there's many many gradients of individuation so you could say that well the average Joe, 
the average duo is probably not going to get naturally individuated or individuated. We're probably not going to get to either. Um, there's a case for them being able to get to a sort of partial natural individuation type thing, but a lot of them might not get to that. Now, there's also going to be a large number of people who will get to natural individuation. I've seen it in many, many people. Um, even before I uh, really looked into spirituality and all the rest of it, I could weirdly have this intuitive power, let's say, to understand these weird people who were like 50 odd and had this thing about them that made me think, oh, they're quite mature and quite well-rounded and stuff. And now I understand, oh, it's because that person's naturally individuated because I can see it now. So I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, ooh, I'm bloody thick, of course, you know, of course they're naturally individuated. But um, but obviously back then you, you have this inkling, but you don't know, you're not quite sure. Um, and then there's other people who you can obviously discern quite naturally as consciously individuated. I shouldn't have used the word naturally there because it probably wasn't the best word to use when I was trying to distinguish between natural and conscious individuation and then using naturally just in a totally different way. Um, but no, you know, there's those people who don't get to natural because even natural individuation, it takes a real, even like with just unconscious individuation, natural individuation, opposed to conscious individuation, even that takes a substantial dying to life, getting rid of the complexes. Um, conscious individuation is just in a different manner as well. Um, but imagine that you've, been aware of these complexes, you've been aware of the shadow, you've obviously got the personal autonomous complex with either your anima or your animus, if you're a man, the anima, if you're a woman, the animus, um, and that has to be understood, again, either unconsciously or consciously over a number of years. Now, the way in which an anima works inside a man, because I can really, I, I struggle with how the animus works in a woman, I kind of can see it a bit, but it's hard. Um, the best way to kind of understand it is for me to demonstrate what it's like. Now, please be aware, this isn't the anima working in me specifically, because it's not spontaneous, it's just me putting it on. But if this was a spontaneous reaction of mine, then it would be my feminine side, my, my anima working within me. So imagine if I'm moaning, I've, 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 had all, I've had all this work to do and I'm like, oh, you know, I've got all this work to do and I just can't do it. And it's just, it's just so frustrating and I can't, I don't enjoy it. And it's not really what I want to do. And it's all, and I've done this before and it's not all the rest of it. And you get into this kind of cyclical thing of going round in that, idea for a few minutes or maybe half an hour or maybe an hour or god knows how long but that's an archetype that's taken you because you can't get out of it easily the archetypes grabbed you the archetypes made you it's it's well you know you can say it's made you it's bitch you know um and and you can't get out of it easily and and that and of course it doesn't help let's say if a man has a negative anima um or an infantile anima, uh, in which then, of course, it's going to be a lot more overbearing. It, it's going to really affect a man's mood a lot more because uh, they've had some negative experiences of a mother in childhood, and then that's gone to um, really, you know, affect these moods and stuff like that because the anima just isn't developed in that person. The more, let's say, the, the more positive sides of the feminine, um, if anything, they're probably projected out, but the more positive sides of the feminine, they're not within the animal internally, they're not there. Um, and so all that sort of beautiful, mature emotionality, um, it, it just isn't, isn't there. And it's this kind of very 
narcissistic emotionality that um, ends up coming out in these, you know, like that sort of when you're confronted with your work and you get emotional over it and you get emotional in a kind of nautsy way and all the rest of it. And that's the archetype working within you, within a mood. That's why Jung said the anima is the source of, uh, is the a priori source of uh, all of the man, man's moods, reactions, and anything other spontaneous in psychic life, because it's it's exactly that. Anything spontaneous. The anima, not only, let's say, if I'm walking down the street and I see um, a beautiful woman and I get that image there, right? And then that comes in my mind as a fantasy. It's like, oh, I can see that woman in, in my mind in a fantasy. And then automatic, and that's the animo as well. That's the autonomous complex within, within you. And uh, automatically you just have a spontaneous reaction to, well, maybe if you're confident enough, go over and talk to that woman. Or if you're not confident enough, walk past her and then just fantasize about her for a while or whatever it may be. Uh, and you're totally out of the present moment and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's that's the anima that's the the anima just enrapturing you for a little bit and projecting itself out and uh you wanting to go and grab it you wanting to go and explore it um you know and, and that's a part of your internal psychology that momentarily has now been projected onto the external world and then you're uh essentially you could say that you've Falling in love at first sight with yourself, not with the actual woman, but with the image of the woman that the anima, your own anima internally is using as an image in your psyche and then thrusting your behavior towards that woman. But it's actually that you're in love with your own anima. It's not that you're in love with that woman. It's not, of course, you can't be in love with that woman. You know, you just bloody seen her, you know, Um, but. Uh, it, it, you're in love with yourself, and so that's why uh, I think it's Marie, uh, Louise von Franz again has said that um, a man has a long way if he if he's like that. A man has a long way before he actually loves the the real woman, the 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 personality, not just you. You see, it's it's been a, a huge challenge for myself. To actually, and I'm I'm not there at all yet, to um, try and love someone for them rather than me just loving my anima. See, a, a young man, this is the problem with being 25, it's, it's, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. I am disgustingly psychologically immature. Anima underdeveloped, animus underdeveloped, shadow is just terribly unintegrated within a social context, persona is just terrible, it, it, the, the persona reactions that I get are, are ridiculous, and, the, and um, the way in which the persona rears its head conversationally as well in, in a social situation is just terrible. I've got such a real bad integration of the Jungian uh, the Jungian, let's say, psychic structures, um, just terrible. The the child archetype runs wa runs rampant in me. All this sort of stuff. I've got bad relationship with the maternal instincts. You name it, I've bloody got it. Don't you know? Jesus, there's, there's a few things I've not got, luckily. But there we go. You know. Um, but no, so that's the anima and that, that captivates the guy and he's off and, and, and that's that. But it doesn't just work in that saying. It works in uh, so fine a, a, a gradient and so fine a little moods here and there. And no doubt even within this video, either prior or, or uh, after this moment, uh, I'll have either been enraptured or will be enraptured somewhat to a degree or maybe not enraptured because that's quite a strong word. But subtly taken by an archetype a little bit, maybe for a moment or maybe for more than a moment. It's how it is, you know. Um, and of course, I'm not going to be individuated till, God, 56 or so. Well, I say 56 because the psyche always, always, always uh, gives me numinous experiences around the, the 
the number 56. So I've now taken that. At first, I thought uh, in a paranoid, neurotic state, that, oh, God, I'm going to die at 56. Um, but now I actually think, no, nah, well, I think I'm, that's probably more likely going to be an estimate for my individuation where I attain my individuation. And individuation is something that happens over the lifespan. So can you imagine, like, you're taken by the idea of the woman. You see that woman walking down the street, you've got this image in your mind and you've, you know, got to go over there and talk to her and all the rest of it. The earliest, the primitive level of the anima in Eve, the four development, uh, developmental stages of the anima, Eve, uh, Helen, Mary, and Sophia, the early stage development of the anima, Eve, is the earthly human woman, right? And so that stage takes ages to get out of. It can take quite a while to get out of us. In fact, some men never get out of it. They never get out of that first stage. So imagine you are 18 or you're 19 or 20 and you see a woman and you go over and you talk to her and all the rest of it. And you've put, got that really, really fierce animus proje anima projection on her. And it's ju you're just being taken by your own anima. Then... And I really do think this is where the honeymoon stage comes from, or the honeymoon phase comes from, because that's the about the phase where the anima starts to become a little bit more mature. It's after that phase that the relationship starts to blossom fully. And I think that that does have to do with, in its timescale, with the, the development of the anima inside the man as well. Um, not necessarily that he's moved on to another stage of development specifically, like, for example, Helena, but that he's at least opening up to that second stage, let's say, after that time period of 12 months or so. Um, of course, it might take for a few people, and it, it really differs for so many people. You can't, you can't really put it down to a four-step process and say, well, it's going to take this exact amount of time or this exact amount of experience. Because for one person, they might be in a relationship, they might be in a relationship for six months or a year, then they might go out of that relationship and then project their anima somewhere else and go on that person and then another person and, and it might take longer. It might take about three years or five years or ten years or however long for various different individuals um, to be able to slowly get out of that stage in their own inner, inner development. But anyway, so they project and then they... they uh, do that and they're enraptured and it's all about sex, you know, it's sex, 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 and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the, the, the earthly, the, the, not the charming, but the enchantress of the anima, the very kind of, um, seductive, physical woman, right? Then you get to Helena. And then that's the philosophical, more feeling relationship with the woman. Again, Marie, uh, Louise von Franz has talked about this. Brilliant interview, actually. The Way of the Dream, it's called, if you want to watch it. This is what I'm referencing. Um, and that's where the man has a relationship with the woman that isn't just sex. You know, it isn't just that. It isn't just... Uh, and of course, we get ourselves into this illusion, first off, when we meet someone, that it isn't just sex, that it is a relationship. But really, in that very, very early stage of a relationship, you don't actually know that much about each other. It is mainly sex, you know, that's what it is. But then we get into the second stage of development, which is a poetic and philosophical and feeling relationship with uh, the woman opposed to, let's say, just the physical domain. And that, of course, can be seen within an external relationship, but it can also be seen internally as uh, the man in his inner development opening up to certain sides to himself that are less just kind of assertively masculine. You know, it's more of a opening up to a feeling dimension of, of femininity. Uh, but of course, that can be perceived in the external relationship in certain individuals, not in all individuals, of course, but in certain individuals of which you have quite a scholarly relationship. So you might have a man and a woman 
um, who have a dimension of their relationship which is scholarly, philosophical, intellectual, poetic, and things like that. Uh, and that can be seen in the external relationship there. And the third development is uh, Mary, the Virgin Mary, which is this beautifully whole, wonderful, uh, and, and now we're getting up there into dimensions that I don't know enough about because I suppose I've not really had them too much in my experience yet. Um, but I can provide you with at least a basic understanding. So you've got this Mary figure, this wonderful, altruistic type woman capable of possessing all sorts of virtue, wonderfully spiritual, um, just this all round, you know, let's say perfect woman in a spiritual sense, not necessarily in the earthly sense of, um, cause if, if we were to take our perfect woman in the earth, uh, earthly sense, I tell you what most men would say, we, we would say, well, you know, I want a woman who's, um, certainly quite uh, emotional and quite nice and quite lovely like that and quite indecisive as well because a man likes to generally be quite decisive and all the rest of it and so they like the opposite in the woman they like that indecisiveness um but they'd also want someone who can be a bit of a seductress um a little bit kind of earthly a little bit passionate a little bit um uh, instinctual as well to give it another word uh you know and, and so certainly not spiritual in a sense of this very very high spiritual level you know of just all goodly and untouched or all that sort of stuff um so that's the third level in which uh it, it's a viewing of the woman in a very very spiritual and very very mature sense but it's not as Marie Louise von Fran says, it's not human. Um, and the highest form of spirituality is human. Because if we think about spiritual masters over the years, we think of Jesus or we think of a Buddha, or we think of these types of people, they all had a physical body. They all had a, um, a somatic existence, if you will, a physical existence, a bodily existence. And in that, they all had their little imperfections that made them more spiritual um, and more well-rounded as well. It, they had that little bit of, uh, I think it's the Yetzirah in, um, I might be slightly pronouncing that wrong. I've pronounced it wrong before, so, you know, always the way. But we yet to have in the Jewish tradition where the, the slight little evil inclination in man, and that's Sophia. Uh, that's the, well, she's fell a little bit to be being a bit more human, but she's spiritualized in her humanity. So there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, something human there, a little bit of something like that. and. Um, Marie Louise von Franz uh, says how basically the wisdom of God, Sophia, is where when you love someone, there's always in the highest element of love, there's always a grain of salt in it. And she says laughingly that uh, I don't want to uh, divulge what that means, but you know me. The shadowy person I am, uh, I'm going to divulge what that means because it's quite well. Well, I'm going to divulge my interpretation on it. So, of course, Sophia, the wisdom of God, the, the seeing the animal and the woman in her full nature, but there is to the fullest spiritualized setting within a human incarnate or a human person. What I believe she's talking about there is, and, and the fact she also actually says at the same time, that the man or the, the individual always takes it with a grain of salt because he knows there's certain elements of woman that are 
uh, that he needs to just be careful of. And so love is kind of this thing of you take it with a pinch of salt because there's certain elements of the feminine that you have to be wary of. There's certain elements of the maternal instinct that you have to be wary of. There's certain elements of um, certain experiences as well within love, within the context of love that you have to have a little bit of knowledge on, that you have to have a little bit of um, understanding of and you have to have a little bit of uh, sort of re reservation with as well and it's not only that because if we take it in a wider wider setting it's kind of like I was talking about with the, the Yetza Harar as well um, this little evil inclination if we take it in a wider setting, that's also in there. That's also in there. That's inclusive within love. Within love, there's a, there's a subtle, subtle, subtle. It's there. There's a subtle, subtle, subtle. Maybe not so subtle, actually. But there's this subtle evil inclination or evil element. And so that's to be aware as well of the, of the, the highest level. But of course... I've not got there yet, so don't take my word for it because I can't say. Um, my anima is, uh, is well, still at Eve. My anima is bloody still at Eve, so don't say that I'm correct in saying that because there's, there's, I can definitely assure you that when Marie-Louise von Franz said that, there was more to it than that as well, but I'm just giving a slight interpretation there of what I can see currently. Um. So, of course, you know, people go through these stages of, of seeing the woman as such and, um, and, and get into a more full understanding. And you can quite clearly see as well how, um, I mean, we have to talk about it in a more general sense rather than talking about it in the sense of conscious individuation. Because the conscious individuation meaning, the spiritual meaning of the last anime, anime development of Sophia means so much more than, let's say, just taken in a very um, general setting. But at the same time, it doesn't mean so much more as just taken in a general relationship setting. But let me explain it in terms of just um, within uh, a relationship. So you imagine you get to that uh, highest level of development, which is the... Uh, the anima that has, that has just fell from Mary and that has just got this little bit of earthliness to her. You can, you, men know that when they get to about 50, 60, they know the woman. They know the little evil elements within her and within love as well and within relationship. They know these certain, well, not all men, of course, but certain men why, get wise to that and get wise to um, the full nature of woman as well. Um, and of course, uh, analogizing this to spirituality or to mysticism or to, um, you know, spiritual awakening or enlightenment or anything like that. It, it's slightly more broad and it slightly encompasses slightly more than just that. But if we're taking it from a more individual, ordinary life type situation, we kind of get these kind of hints with this development. And, uh, and so also in the Mary idea, there's... Not only the idea of altruism and spiritualism and uh, this compassion and this agreeableness and this beauty in terms of a, a very, um, what would you call it, uh, a sort of a, a, a beauty for mankind and for giving and for being... Um, and for sacrificing themselves for the greater good of, of all and stuff like that. And again, 
this gives us, and this is what I was just trying to get to as well, to describe that stage of development in a bit more detail. This is what we see within the woman. We see that within the woman, uh, or a man sees that within a woman uh, as they slowly get older as well. This kind of beautiful, and this is also the loyalty of the animal as well. This is what gives us a an idea of the loyalty of the anima, that, that which is the wonderful, uh, genuine concern of the woman. And that scene in Mary, in, the, in that stage of development, and how women will often go beyond what's necessary to help people, to make people happy, to make the right things happen. I, I've seen this in my family, my, my mom or my grandma and grand, my grandma or either grandma, whoever it is, whether it's my dad or it's my granddad or it's myself or whoever, they've often gone beyond the call of duty to help and to, to um, make sure that things are right and that things are done right. And not only that, but also within fr friends, people they're very, very friendly with, they go beyond and above the call of duty. And that's Mary. That's the, the real positive, spiritual, totally virtuous, wonderful side of a woman. But that's not quite the full woman, you see. So when you get to that, it's not quite there. Um, there's still a little bit, further to go to be able to discern the full woman. Um, so we have to be careful, you know, of um, of the anima, in a sense. So getting back to talking about that in a little bit more detail. And so when we've gone through all those stages, of course, we then get to be a more integrated whole individual with all of that knowledge of the feminine within ourselves and expressed partially through our personality. If we're a man, expressing it, you know, partially part of the time because biologically and personality wise, we are a man. So we express that as we are. Uh, if you're a woman, then again, with your animus development, um, the man, uh, the, the, the first theme, the very, very strong man, there's, again, there's four levels of development, but um, I don't, I, I can't remember the exact four levels of development, but I know it's kind of the strong man, then it's the man of action, then it's the kind of the professor and things like that, and then it's the, um, uh, the, the kind of almost very, very strong public uh, figure, like a president or something like that. Or you could also argue um, one of those kind of sage-like figures as well, uh, you know, a sort of sage-like figure. And again, we can do this for a woman when a woman's younger, let's just say sort of on a stereotypical level, because of course there's many, many varieties of women out there, many, many varieties of different people. But if we're doing it on this more stereotypical uh, level, maybe a woman's a little bit un unsure of herself, a little bit uncertain. And so in university or in college, they, um, they see these wonderful strong men that are around and they feel, oh, he's strong and he's this and he's that. And they, they obviously feel attraction there because it's a physical attraction. And then... Uh, then obviously something may happen between those two and then that's the first stage of development, that that man of strength. And uh, again, that can take quite a while to develop. And then it's the man of action. Um, uh, I think also um, Lord Byron was, was quoted as possibly being um, within the man of action as well. But some... Some sort of man who has a little bit of a shadowy side. And this is going to be very hard for me to try and relate because I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know that side as much. But if I'm, if I'm trying to understand it, let's say, it's someone who 
has a certain drive within the world, has a certain accomplish, a, uh, a nature to accomplish, a spirit within the world, and that has also uh, a bit of a shadowy side as well. The 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 earliest stage of the animus, the um, what was it called? The the man of physical power. He's very very shadowy. He's not even really a personality. Just like when the anima get, gets projected onto a woman, and as I said, like it's mainly sex, and there's not really you don't really love the person. That's the first stage of animus development as well. But then the second stage is like, well, this guy's got a bit of spirit. He's out in the world. He's he's uh, got some sort of um, something to him, some sort of substance there, some sort of action substance. Uh, and he, again, he's a little bit, he's got a little bit of a shadow. He's got a bit of a shadow side, but not as much. Then you get to the third stage of development, which is like the professor or the clergyman or something like that. And that's the man of the word, the meaning, the logos. And um, he's like not shadowy to the woman, really. He's he's not really, there's not much of that in him. There's a bit of it in him, but not much at all. He's not quite like Mary, but he's similar in the sense that he's quite virtuous. He's seen as quite, you know, this man who's uh, a vessel of meaning, a vessel of spirit in the scholarly sense of um, providing philosophical meaning within the woman's life. Uh, meaning on a very, very transcendent level. And uh, so whenever a woman fantasizes, let's say, about uh, the the whole professor fantasy. Of course, in the woman's mind, there is a little bit of this kind of firm and strong and potentially slightly shadowy nature, because of course that's what attracts a woman. That what that's what turns her on to that fantasy. There has to be a bit of that in there. But what really gets her, especially if she's fairly intelligent, is the idea of that man simulating her intellectually. Because don't forget, women are a lot more mature than men. Women need a lot more um, stimulation. You know, for men, well, you know, of course, a man, well, a bit of sex, that's fine. For the most part, for, the, for a long time in his life. Then he starts mature. But a woman needs that, craves that intellectual um, stimulation. And so she she's attracted possibly more so by the intelligence and the scholarliness and the, the real meaning that that, man, that that man has, not just the, the, the slight, you know, of course, spirited firmness that he has, that is a very, very, uh, still, still a sort of segment of that man of physical power that we first saw in the first level of de development. That's still there subtly. But then, of course, you get the transcended meaning or the transcended logos in the the more kind of world leader like figure. Uh, and when I say world leader like figure, I don't mean a world leader who is corrupt and who is bad and shadowy like so many world leaders can be. But I mean more of a a very very philosophically centered world leader, a very he, he, he wants the good of the people and all this, and he's, he's centered on a collective goal of humanity. He wants to make sure that he is ruling for the good of the people, and he still has those negative aspects of a man, but he uses them in a positive way. His shadow is oriented um, at making sure he, he, he's those negative sides of himself, those more firm sides and those more strength sides are basically oriented at the collective goal of helping humanity. So he uses his shadow side, like I touched upon in another video, for the good of a collective goal of humanity. And he makes sure that he is using those shadow sides in uh, the positive manifestation of trying to overcome the evil in the world by the fact that he has uh, part of a shadow side that then allows him to have the the 
strength and the dominance to be able to get over that that uh, evil within the world and and form a collective uh, meaning that can be the new meaning of uh, the society, the given society. And um, I say world leader, actually, I don't mean world leader, I mean um, sort of like, you know, president of a country, that's what I mean. But of course, then he's the one who manifests the new, the, the, the new meaning and, and pushes humanity into a, a new better age and so that's the animus in the full development and the animus in an in an inner development within the woman because of course this can be an outer development in terms of if the woman goes through having relationships similar to this um of course we would have to dull it down a bit in the case of a world leader and all the rest of it but in the woman having similar relationships to this to a subtle degree or it, uh, but obviously it's uh, more reflective in of an inner development um and the animus then becomes a if in the inner development when the animus is fully mature it becomes a beautiful beacon for um for creativity for spirited creativity what that means is that the woman becomes more assured of herself because she's got an alignment with that inner masculinity. You see, what I've not mentioned here is that the anima, the, the feminine principle in Jungian psychology, represents the soul. And the animus represents the spirit. So the animus, of course, like we see with young men out there, going out, being very, very spirited, um, and they uh, represent the, the spirit, the, the kind of get up and go, all that sort of stuff. Now, of course, that's not to say that a woman doesn't possess that from the outs offset. Of course, the woman possesses that from the offset as well. Um, just like the man also possesses the soul in terms of the feeling, the creativity, the emotionality, things like that. Obviously, both men and women can have the ability to utilize those things. But the animus has it or the, the man has it more so in the spirited sense, and a woman has it more so in the soulful sense. So when the animus is fully developed in a woman's psyche, she has more of a certainty in her own ideas and in her own opinions, because that masculine is working as an inner spirited creative force, not in creativity in the sense of uh, an artistry or anything like that but a creativity to create to be uh, certain within your actions that sort of creativity because creativity in the sense of artistry and create creating things in a in a beautiful soulful sense that's more the domain of the anima um so the woman at the le that level of development gets a wonderful beautiful spurring of, of creativity from that inner masculine that she's claimed. And the man, on the flip side, gets a, a more beautiful, passionate relationship, a feeling relationship that can so be considered um, almost maternal in a way, which is a relationship with his inner feminine. And I say this, and I'll give you a great example. So we'll go back to that man who is... Um, like 55, and let's say he is naturally individuated, for example, then he might come across a woman at work, and let's say this woman is 18. Really, she's a girl, to be honest. And she's just come on the team, and she's come on his team. And, oh, she's uncertain of herself, and she's she's worried, and she's not she doesn't quite know what she's doing or the rest of it within a particular role because, of course, no one really does anyway. And it's the same for a man. Even a young man generally has a little bit of that uncertainty and stuff. But one can be inside the other, just like with the yin and yang, with uh, the little bit of the yin being inside the yang and a little bit of the yang being inside the yin and all that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, it depends on individual complexes or individual experiences in which, uh, me, you know, a certain man might just have a better relationship with that animo and then end up having 
uh, more of a feminine side because of that. And then some women having a better relationship with their animus, then them having a uh, more masculine side because of that. And therefore them being maybe some women being more uh, certain and then other men being more uncertain. So it works in all different ways. And it can be colored in so many, so many different ways. But we'll take this example. So anyway, the woman uh, is, is is like that. And the man who's uh, un, uh, naturally individuated, unconsciously individuated, 55, he has this brilliant ability to be able to be maternal with a woman like that. Whereas Playa, he, he might have been okay with her in that situation, but he might have just been a little bit too much on the masculine side. But now he has this wonderful access to a beautiful maternal nature. And don't forget, the maternal nature is within the traits of, uh, within the maternal instinct. So generally, it's a, it's a feminine thing. And it's from the maternal instinct that Peterson has kind of, or I would said this is probably how he's got to the conclusion, is why the woman is more agreeable. Uh, and, and as well, uh, that could also be argued uh, among other neuropsychological factors, why the woman could be said to, to be slightly more emotional as well. Now, the argument for men being less emotional, women, women being more emotional, comes down in biological terms, and I do hold a biological viewpoint, not a socialized or so well, not a social constructivist viewpoint, mainly because of the maternal instinct differ differentiating it, differentiating itself in the in the woman, and therefore, um, in instinctual terms, there are certainly biological behavioral differences between man and woman. Uh, I'm not going to refute the idea, particularly of the social constructivist argument, but from what I've done, from the research I've done, and believe me. Like the amount of time I have developed devoted to thinking about this is insane. It's insane. So I am fully assured that the biological behavioral idea is uh, more correct than the social constructivist argument of there being uh, of of gender uh, ideas being some sort of perceptional thing um and and that man and woman are uh just just perceptions or feminine and masculine are just perceptions I do not believe that one bit i have looked into it so much so much so much now that's not to say that uh other gender identities don't exist what it's to say is that other gender identities are a very, very complex formulation of archi of individualized archetypal instinctual um, phenomenon. And that is completely natural as far as I'm concerned. And um, so, I mean, there are subtle arguments that you can place biologically that say, well, do we have to worry that if we're going to be moving away in gender perceptions from the natural biological behavioral tendencies of gender in terms of man and woman, does that constitute the um, instinctual archetypal differentiation within a person's subjective psyche as being a gender other than man and woman, does that constitute something that's slightly unnatural or unnatural? And, do it, and is that co co cause for concern? Yes, it can be quite an offensive viewpoint to take, but I uh, think that we have to analyze all different areas. And so that is one area for analysis that we, we may want to um, analyze. But no, I do hold uh, a biological uh, behavioral viewpoint. Um, and it is generally the, the clinch. One of the clinches for me, there's a few clinches, but one of the clinches for me is just even on its own, the maternal instinct. And uh, of course, the, the fact that uh, men and women physiologically 
a, a different and display um, differences as well. Um, but anyway, so the man over all that experience of women over the years and years and years gets a little piece of this maternal warmth now in his personality. And so he, he goes to that woman and he sees she's struggling. And instead of like a young man who's all this spirited bastard, who's like, oh, you can't do it, you know, or whatever they're doing, or taking the piss out of them because actually secretly we want to sleep with them. And so they obviously think, and quite naturally as well, instinctually, in instinctual terms, it's a good strategy to take. You take the piss out of a woman and then, oh, she gets a bit uncertain and insecure. And then suddenly, oh, you know, she then colours you in the light of certainty because you're, of course, portraying to her that you're quite certain of yourself when you're kind of pissing her off and stuff. So then she turns to you and thinks, oh, well, he's certain of himself. And yeah, he's a bit of a bastard, but I think I can probably change him. I think I think I can probably get that bastard out of him. So then she ends up ending up falling into his arms and the two end up bloody falling in love. That's how it works. But anyway, the, the, the old man's got... The older, well, not the old man. He's only 55. The, the older man has got over that and he, he's obviously married anyway and all the rest of it. So he... He goes to the woman uh, and uh, he, he treats her as a daughter. And maybe he's also got daughters of his own. So he, he very well knows it, that ask, aspect of the feminine in that sense as well. Uh, but he goes over and he displays this beautiful emotionality and this beautiful warmth. And he's, he's, he's grown into life. And he's not only grown into his masculinity, but he's grown into his femininity. And that's made him whole. And he portrays that where necessary and he's just a little bit more reserved. He's not this callous brute of a man who's just, you know, let's just go out, lads, let's just do what we want, you know, all that shadowy element of the masculine, the overbearing animus, as it were, that's so young and, and immature. He, he's not that anymore. And so he, he displays this beautiful warmth and uh, I can't describe it too well because... I've only had experiences of it every now and then, because obviously I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very experienced, so I can't really say for certain what this thing is. Come back to me when I'm 56. There you go. I'll get it then. Especially if I've had kids. If I've had kids, and maybe I've had a daughter or two. God, yeah, I'll know it then. Like, be on it. But um, now, at the moment, at 25, I'm too immature. I don't know it much. Um, but it's almost as if you get this beautiful, spontaneous, unique feeling relationship for that person, which is not coloured at all by any physiological idea or idea of sex or anything like that. It's way beyond that. It's a more, it's a so much more mature uh, feeling, and it's this wonderful, all-embracing love that we could so associate with a grandmother and a grandmother's love for her child, for not her child, but her uh, grandchild. And the way, the all-encompassing nature of that grandma's love for that child and uh, within the confines of uh, that more positive aspect of, of love, not necessarily the, the more possessive aspect of love, but the positive aspect of love. And it's real desire to help and this real lovely mature feeling reaction that's, that Marie-Louise von Franz would call differentiated feeling um, and that's beautiful and that's lovely and that's wonderful and that's the one of the real boons it's not the only boon but it's one of the real boons of individuation for a man um, because it's the thing that he lacks in his life it's the thing that he never had so he never, never had. So one thing that a woman possessed that he doesn't have a relationship with. And so in his maturation of personality, as he's in his growing out from that small little tree into that rooted tree in life, he gets that ability to um, to be mature and to be, well, rooted in, in, in life, grown into life, just like that tree, as I say, just like that huge oak. Um, 
And so that, in a sense, is is individuation for, for practically all it's worth. It's that real growing into life. Now, of course, what comes with that as well, whether you're in natural individuation or in conscious individuation, is a relationship with society. And you are known because you have gained a certain uh, role within society and a certain, you've built a certain life within society as well. That's a part of individuation. That's the extroverted uh, human hero's journey part of individuation. And uh, you have had a certain affiliation and a certain reinforcement over a number of years with a particular uh, instinctual expression. So like for myself, my individuation is of course going to come within the um, instinct for curiosity, which as I've mentioned many times before, seems to have differentiated itself within the human brain in the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain that deals with cognition and abstract ideas, abstract thinking. The instinct for curiosity in one of its manifestations in humans, in the intelligent human brains that we've got, have differentiated itself in the prefrontal cortex for intelligence. And that in turn has gone to create uh, the philosopher, the sage, the any, any anyone really who has this compulsion towards intellectual curiosity and, in, and intellectual ideas. And of course, in modern parlance, um, within the idea of uh, the big five factor model, this is called openness to experience. And it is a sub facet of the trait openness to experience. And we can clearly discern that openness to experience has approximately a 50% hereditary component to it as a personality trait. And that in itself is related to a, to a particular instinct. Now, the psychologists won't tell you this because they don't, most of them don't know it. Um, because unfortunately, a lot of psychologists don't partake in too much abstract thinking. Psychologists are turning into people with high conscientiousness instead of high trait openness to experience. But we won't go along my route of prejudices towards certain areas of scientific psychology um, because, of course, uh, that gets us into uh, another topic of individuation, which is the idea of overcoming prejudices within uh, certain roots within life. But of course, the sage, um, they may flower out as that instinct, and that instinct get, gets reinforced in them, and they go through life, and they blossom out in that particular way. And so you get the individuated philosopher, you get the individuated psychologist, or whatever, those kind of things. Or maybe, and they've grown into life, and they've rooted just like that tree, or in the analogy of the tree where we're growing up and we're growing out into an individuated person, the tree also buries roots in the ground. And those roots are uh, analogous to uh, rooting yourself within society in a certain position. And, and so you become that big, strong oak tree that's very, very firmly rooted in the ground or rooted in society in a particular manner. So, of course, you have all these different people who root themselves in, in that manner. And, of course, along all this process, along all this extroverted journey, is the, the time in which, again, either unconsciously or consciously, you are getting over all these complexes. You're making yourself almost complex-free. Now, no one can be complex-free. We all have, to some degree, some small complexes within, within us. But to the best degree, you are getting rid of your prejudices. Uh, just like for myself, one of my prejudices is uh, the slight prejudice towards scientific rationalism that I still have, um, opposed to, let's say, spirituality. So that's something that that's a that is a, a almost a psych. Well, it's a psychic splitting in a, in a in some regard, in a mild regard. Although I would say in my case, it's actually to a more high regard. Um, 
But that in itself is something to overcome in the process of individuation. And the way you do that is you die into life. You embrace those things that you don't want to embrace. And so that happens over the period of this very, very long 20, 30, well, really like 50 year period or so if we're taking it from birth. Although, you know, you could argue maybe it's not quite happening from birth, but there is certainly a, an argument to say that it is happening from birth in instinctual terms and in reactions with your sense reactions, sense perceptions with your environment and memories being built up and certain things there. It's almost as if individuation starts from birth in an unconscious setting. Um, but yeah, over this 50 year period, you get over all those complexes and then you slowly integrate your anima, anima, shadow, persona, those kind of things. And then you get to this beautiful, unique, individualized expression of a particular set. And I do say set because it's not just one archetype. It's not that just a person says, well, I'm a representation of the sage archetype. As a person gets older and they let's say they specialize more, yes, they do start to represent mainly one archetype. You talk about a particular philosopher and you think of one archetype. Sorry, you talk about a particular person and you think of one archetype. You talk about Grace and Perry, you think about the creator archetype or the artist. You talk about Jordan Peterson, you think about the sage archetype, the philosopher, the psychologist, that sort of area. So as you get older and you root yourself more and more in society and more and more within your own individuation, you do get more specialized to one archetype. But you're never just expressing one archetype in terms of the wholeness of who you are. You're always a mixture of different archetypes. And there may be a few different archetypal associations or instinctual associations that you've reinforced over or that have been reinforced within you over a long time period that then uh, allow people to recognize you uh, as an individual and also simultaneously as a collective archetype as well or collective grouping of archetypes. So I think that's all I'd, I'd like to say on individuation. I think there is different aspects and more aspects to it. We could really, really drill down into this. Uh, we could go a little bit further. But I think I'll leave it there. Um, I can only hope, and I'll end on a little bit of a personal note, I can only hope that um, my particular structures uh, integrate over time. And by the time I'm 56, I do get individuation. I get it in a uh, positive manner, in uh, the manner of uh, being a sage, let's say. Um, you know, it, it seems as, as I get older and older, I, I, and I know I'm only, t I know I'm only 25. I'm, I'm aware of my immaturity and my age. I'm not saying that I'm old and old and old and old, but I do I think about things so much that I do feel a lot older than I am, as many regulars will know. But I do feel as I get older that it just doesn't matter what, you know, whatever I turn out as. The fact is that if I turn out as an individual, that's what is the pinnacle. That's to what, what's to be looked forward to. It doesn't matter if I'm a sage. It doesn't matter if I'm recognized as a poet or, or this. And obviously a poet would come into the creator archetype, which by the way, is the constructivist, uh, con constructivism, not constructivism, the instincts for constructiveness. That's what the creator archetype is aligned to. Uh, just in case you wanted to know, because I've, I've, Basically, I wanted to align, you know, obviously Jung talked about the archetypes being forming strong analogies to the instincts. Well, what I wanted to do was actually align them to instincts to a really good degree to try and understand, oh, actually, yeah, they really do. They really are psychological phenomena of the instincts and psychological images of the instincts as well, the archetypes are. So that's what I did, and I went through and tried to do it for most of them. I still haven't done it for all of them, but I've done it for most of the, the main ones and stuff. Um, and some of the instincts actually split off and form 
sort of duplicate of archetypal associations based on the evolution of the brain and the evolution of intelligence within mankind, which is very, very interesting. Um, so yeah, I can only hope that I am an individual and that I gain that individuation in a uh, setting of being myself and being able to present myself in society uh, and not sacrificing any part of what that means. Um, and having a good association with my shadow and uh, removal of of any uh, specific persona issues and uh, the ability to get over, let's say, the moodiness of my animo in its current manifestation uh, and its current, let's say, um, archetypal enrapturing of my personality and also uh, develop my anima to a level of uh, of a... a sort of a, uh, a good stage of possibly Sophia and also get a better relationship with my animus because for me as well my animus I've not got so much of a great relationship even with my animus uh, although in a way I just consciously portray that a lot of the time anyway so I, I suppose there's two sides to it but I do feel as if I'm still not got too much of a, a great relationship with my animus but that may be very well cured and I do feel it would be by a better relationship with my anima so that you know there's obviously that in there and hopefully uh, I can flower out as an eccentric uh, individual with a, a, an association with not only the creator archetype not only the sage archetype but uh, potentially the, the child archetype as well that that kind of not the um, infantile sort of closed off uncertainty of the child archetype or the child, but uh, more of the wondrous creativity and wonder that the child has. Uh, just that beautiful, bouncing, uh, carefreeness that the child has. I think there is some of, well, there's a lot of that within my personality, but some of it is tied to certain complexes that really make it have more of an infantile expression whereas if I can get rid of those things that are like those complexes that are almost like a cloud over the actual genuine original expression of that child archetype within me as a whole person then I think when I'm older I can have a good mild relationship to that carefree sort of wondrous creativity of the child and that kind of just wondrous fun um element to it and also like that little bit of eccentricity that the that certainly I as a child had but certainly the, the child archetype can be seen to have in certain circumstances as well but anyway I'll leave it there guys thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys <laughs>